Dr. Cuddy, thanks very much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. And are we going to be going on with your book on uh, the, uh, the the power elite, their history, and their future? Uh, yes. Uh huh. I uh, <clears throat> usually have some sort of uh, comment about uh, contemporary issues, but uh, the uh, the plan is uh, is just you know, still unfolding. People tend to whether they're on these uh, Sunday talk shows or whatever. Uh, tend to analyze things in terms of what they appear to be. Uh, you know, this is the stock market going up, is the stock market going down, uh, what's going on in Syria, uh, what's uh, happening in Egypt, and so forth and so on. And uh, it's, it's, it, in a way, it's sort of humorous to, to watch how they, they tend to look at things as they're unfolding, and, and I guess that's natural if you don't know that uh, most of this is just part of some long-range plan anyway. And so I was listening to the usual uh, Rush Limbaugh's, Glenn Beck's, uh, Sean Hannity. They're 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 wondering, you know, they're wondering. I, I wonder what the future is going to be, and you know, I wonder if uh, if the economy is coming back, and so forth and so on. And uh, it, it gives you a whole different perspective when you understand that, uh, the, that there's a plan and there's a timetable. And so that, uh, it, it's not a matter. Uh, somebody was uh, up at the grocery store, and I, I ran into them, and I had shared one of my books with them. And they were asking about well, what's, what's going to happen you know, in the next year or so. And I said, well, here, here's, here's the way it works. Uh, he was actually from Western Africa. He's a security fellow, and he's getting his doctorate in economics. And so I said, well, you might like to look at uh, my News with Views column. Uh, one of them's called Suckernomics, and another one is called Looming Economic Disaster. And he says, well, you know, uh, what are the indicators? What are the indicators that this disaster is going to happen? I said, well, it, it, you, don't, <laughs> you don't really, you don't use your normal indicators to, to see currently what is happening because these people, uh, the power leaders, I call them, they're not stupid. And so they don't, they don't uh, have something obvious that the public is going to see because if the public saw something obvious, they'd react to it. And they don't want that. So I said what they do is they manipulate things. And then I reminded him, and he, he remembered how George Soros, with a click of a mouse, had uh, taken a huge chunk of money that he had already put into Malaysia and just yanked it out of there, and he brought the country of Malaysia to his knees. I said, this, this is how they work. They manipulate things. And I gave him an example of the stock market. And anyway, after I explained it, he, he agreed. I said, look, the, the, big, the big shots, they drive the stock market in by plunging in there. Then the little guy comes in and makes it go even further upward. Then the big guys sell, <clears throat> sending it into a descent. Then the little guys get out, and it descends even further. Then the big shots get in again at the bottom. And this is how they play this game. And so they can manipulate things however they please, whether it's the price of gold, whatever it is. And so you have to look at actually the timetable. And uh, he, I think he finally understood. Hold that oh, thought. Hold that thought. We'll be back in a moment with Dr. Cuddy. Well, this is Dr. Stan. Our guest is Dr. Dennis Cuddy, who is certainly part of the Reagan administration, uh, the Department of Education. He's taught at the university level. He certainly is, has uh, been a consultant for industry, but he's a prolific writer. If you don't read his articles, certainly, other than the uh, news with views, you should. Uh, but uh, basically, and we do carry his books, but basically he's talking about what really goes on in the world. And you have to understand that everything is manipulated, a small group of people control everything but what they do is they move in such a way it's very difficult for the average person to see what's happening or certainly if you read the wall street journal for instance they'll have all sorts of uh, conflicting articles one day they'll tell you that uh, the big banks aren't lending uh, the next day they'll tell you that big banks are lending and and of course the economy is picking up and uh, suddenly uh, and basically they have an organized program of deceiving the public so they really can't understand what's happening and they won't be able to move quickly enough and basically of course the elite are making fabulous sums of money whether the markets go up or down and right now the market is going down and they're beginning to contract the economy dr dennis kelly you pick up the story 
Yeah, they'll <clears throat> uh, they'll contract it, uh, but then they might even expand it. It's it's a matter of playing this game to uh, trick the people into thinking things are normal or, or getting slightly worse. But there's the, there's the light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, it's not just the individual events of any given day that they manipulate. But it's, uh, it's, as I've said about uh, various fields, whether it's education or whatever it is, that the system, it's not just the problem with a superintendent of schools. The superintendent comes from a particular college of education. You have to be accredited by the state to have such a position. And so it, even if you get rid of the superintendent, you're going to get another one, even though he may come in and say nice things and sound real good. Uh, he's got to be accredited and certified and so forth by the same institution which gave you the previous one. And you don't get admitted to the program unless you have a particular educational philosophy. And they, they weed people in and people out. And as, uh, as I heard when I went to Washington in the Reagan administration, they, they would tell you that the saying was personnel is policy. And that's what Cecil Rhodes was doing. He figured by six uh, decades, uh, 60 years, he'd have enough of his people in place by around 1950, this is the uh, secret society began in uh, 1891, he'd have enough people in place and he would not need a conspiracy. I mean, he wouldn't even need it. Uh, his 3,000 or so people, Rhodes Scholars and others, that he had gotten in place, they would be appointed university presidents and be editors of newspapers and, you know, all this. So hold this- that thought. Hold that thought. We'll be back here in just a moment with Dr. Dennis Cuddy. <laughs> Well, this is Dr. Castan, and certainly Dr. Cuddy is simply talking about how things work today. He points out certainly that Cecil Rhodes organized a secret society back in 1891, but he thought that in by 60 years, why he'd have enough people in place, uh, certainly in key positions, they wouldn't need a conspiracy anymore, to have people in key positions in universities and in finance and in industry, and they would certainly be able to bring about and work for this one world government, and of course that is what is really going on today. We have a small group of people who run the world. The average individual doesn't understand, but of course certainly Dr. Cuddy was commenting on the importance of the uh, road scholarships, and uh, of course who runs the United States today? Well, you may think it's Barack Hussein Obama, but it's not. It's a woman named Susan Rice. Who is Susan Rice? She's the National Security Advisor to the President. She has an office in the White House. He tells Barack Obama what to do every day. Where did Susan Rice go to school? Why she went to Oxford University. She was a Rhodes Scholar. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She was a member, certainly, of the Trilateral Commission before she became the American Ambassador to the United Nations during the first Obama administration. And today she is the National Security Advisor who controls everything Barack Hussein Obama does. He gets the flack, but of course he's doing just exactly what he's told, and the average individual has no idea what's going on, and he suddenly fixes his attention on Barack Obama and what he says, whereas Barack Obama is simply carrying out the the programs laid out for him by a woman who is trained at Oxford, a disciple of Cecil John Rhodes. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, okay, uh, there's uh, there, there's actually uh, a group of them there. I, I call them handlers. Uh, Susan Rice uh, controls a lot of the, the foreign policy and so forth. Uh, so you have to have a sort of policy person in in foreign affairs because usually domestic and foreign affairs are somewhat separate. And so uh, Susan Rice, the uh, Rhodes Scholar, will basically control <laughs> what goes on in terms of national security and, uh, and foreign affairs. In terms of domestic affairs, personal political advice is Valerie Jarrett, who came with him from Chicago. And uh, Valerie Jarrett uh, is not by accident in, in that position. She was actually born in Iran and speaks Farsi, and her father went there in 1952. Now, you know, what are the odds of somebody's dad uh, going to Iran in 1952 just as uh, they're about to, in 1953, overthrow the elected Mossadegh government uh, with the CIA and uh, uh, a bunch of uh, Nazis and some others uh, plotting the overthrow to, to get rid of Mossadegh uh, while blaming it on the uh, Tudor Party, which is the pro-Soviet political party. And so uh, she was born in uh, 53, uh, just as the uh, uh, 
the uh, coup uh, was happening. And so not, not only is she a personal advisor who's known him from Chicago, uh, but she also has that, that sort of background where, whereby the, the father, May, he was a medical doctor, may have been uh, you know, a, a part, part of some a larger effort. We'll just put it that way. I mean, he could have been a doctor in Belgium you know, or uh, Kenya or something. No, no, it was in Iran just before the, the coup started. Now, I, I don't know. I can't prove that he was part of this scenario, but it just seems like a, a really major coincidence. And then, of course, Michelle Obama is uh, the, the personal. So you have a personal handler, that's Michelle. You have a domestic policy handler, that's Valerie Jarrett. And then you have a foreign affairs, foreign policy handler, Susan Rice. So they're, they're sort of circling him, you know, this <laughs> is sort of like a triumvirate uh, around him uh, telling him, you know, what to do. Because uh, as, as Hillary Clinton once, in a rare moment of truth, said uh, during the first campaign of 2008, all Barack Obama has is a speech. <laughs> That's all he had. He didn't even attend committee hearings in you know the areas of foreign affairs that dealt with Afghanistan. So he was he didn't know anything. All right, so uh, yeah, they uh, they have the handlers, and so in terms of uh, economics, uh, as I said before the break. Uh, what you would have is, uh, is there There are indicators. You can look at the indicators, but they, the point is they can manipulate the indicators. They can push them up, push them down, pull them down, whatever they want to, to you know, get whatever desired effect they want. And uh, But it's not just the day-by-day indicators that one looks at. One looks at the system, the whole system. And I mentioned a comparison to the educational system, how the whole system is People think, well, I will rally, you know, and I'll change education in my state. Well, you know, good luck. You're going to get the same sort of superintendents that, that you had before because it's going to have to be accredited. Well, the same thing holds true with the economic system. Once you start manipulating the statistics, you pretty well can control what the public thought is. Uh, once you start eliminating uh, people who have start, stopped looking from work for the unemployment role, I mean, well, you know, <laughs> it's, it skews the whole thing. I mean, it just skews the whole thing. If you're not going to count the, you know, 10, 20, whatever percent who stopped looking for work, then you don't really get an accurate figure of how many people are unemployed. And basically, of course, when they tell us now that unemployment is down to 6.7 percent, well, of course, go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics own website and look up U6 unemployment, not U3 unemployment. U6, that includes the people who certainly are underemployed or have given up looking for work. It's well over 14 percent. And then sure. go to shout out of statistics.com. John Williams, who calculates this as they did uh, unemployment 20 years ago, and it's well over 22%. They're simply lying, ladies and gentlemen. They simply lie. But then, of course, how else can you can deceive the American people? we got a real problem, and they're trying to tell us that things are getting better, things are looking up. My goodness, more people are buying homes. Well, they didn't buy so many homes last month, but well, look what happened in two year 2013. Overall, 2013 was fine, but they don't tell you, of course, that home sales are really moving and moving down rapidly in December and January. So basically, they can make you believe whatever they want you to believe, and that's exactly what's happening today. But we're moving, in, I believe, into very, very difficult times. Certainly, the world economy is contracting all over Europe and China and Asia and Africa and South America, and they're telling us things are looking better. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Go right ahead. Head. Uh, yeah, and and two things uh, uh, regarding what you just said. Uh, when uh, there are the people who have stopped looking for work, if you look at U6, that, and, and then you, like you said, underemployed. Now, <clears throat> underemployed is, uh, in fact, probably as important as those who have stopped looking for work because underemployed not only means that you're in a, a uh, lesser position, but you may have moved from a manufacturing job of, say, $15 an hour uh, down to a service industry job of, say, $9 an hour. So your uh, disposable income is far less as well. Now, that means that you're going to be buying less radios and cell phones and whatever. And that, in turn, translates because everybody's going to buy food. You know, you're going to buy your bread, your milk, and so on. So you'll actually have less to consume on manufactured items. Well, we already have a <laughs> descending manufacturing capability here since we sent a lot of manufacturing jobs overseas with the incentives of Congress. When you, when you tell Company X, 
that, okay, you have now get, have an incentive to go locate Bangladesh or China, wherever. And by the way, once you get over there, if you bring those profits back here, we're going to tax them. But if you keep your profits over there, we won't tax them. And so that's what I mean by the system. The system's rigged. It's not just you look at a particular indicator of, you know, there were so many goods sold this year or that year or whatever. Uh, but you, you have to look at those considerations. Now you'll say, well, you know, we still have these fine American companies. Really? In one of my News with Views columns, in one of my previous books, I actually put the percentage, the percentage of companies in various industries which may have an American name, but we don't own them. You know, they're owned by somebody in the Netherlands or Belgium or... England or China or wherever, they, they got an American name on it, but, you know, 50.1% of the, uh, the the company is owned by some foreign conglomerate somewhere, and it's really a subdivision, although they will keep the name. You know? Because it's so interesting, that's exactly what happened to Chrysler. People have forgotten that when Chrysler got some problems back in 2008, uh, then what did Barack Hussein Obama do? Did he turn it over to another American company? No, he gave it to an Italian company. He gave it to Fiat. Why did he give it to Fiat? Why? Because the head of Fiat was a member of the Trilateral Commission. So basically, he did what he was told to do, and Chrysler is no longer an American corporation. But the average American doesn't understand that. However, they're beginning to increasingly to shift their production facilities to Italy and to European areas, and so more jobs are leaving America. Why did we subsidize Chrysler and then turn it over to an Italian company? Because, of course, Barack Obama's loyalty is not to America, but to this globalist or internationalist dream. And nobody's pointing out why Why didn't they try to keep Chrysler here? Well, because our leaders are, have no loyalty to America. It's all about internationalism and, of course, this little clique that runs the world, the Trilateral Commission. Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, he, he said, I mean, he's not hiding it. He keeps calling himself a world citizen, so you, you know right there. And I've already explained how the word citizen is important rather than the world resident, world inhabitant. When you're a citizen of, let's say, California or somewhere, then you have legal, legal obligations under state law. So if you're going to call yourself a world citizen, that means you're accepting uh, legal obligations uh, by, you know, some world body. And you'll say, well, there's no world government yet. Well, almost. It may as well be. When we uh, signed on to NAFTA and GATT, despite about 70, 75 percent of the American people saying we don't want to be part of NAFTA or GATT, that shows you how much Congress listens to us. You know, they're supposed to be representing us, but they didn't give diddly about any any will of the American public. They were told by their major contributors, you know, financial bigwigs, uh, what they were going to vote for and what they weren't going to vote for. And so we adopted NAFTA and GATT. And part of GATT is the World Trade Organization, and about 80% of the decisions of the World Trade Organization have gone against the U.S. They've literally forced our Congress to change its laws. Now, once you get a, an international body like these unelected bureaucrats in the World Trade Organization forcing Congress to change its laws, you no longer have national sovereignty. So we've already lost a lot of that. And of course, we have a world army that's a, a NATO. So do we have a world bank? So do we have a, a world commerce? We have a world health organization. Everything is in place, certainly for a world government. And the average American has no idea that our leaders are subversives. They have no loyalty to America. It's to this internationalist dream. The establishment of a one world government under a ruling elite and of course the destruction of the sovereignty and freedom of the American people. Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Uh, okay, and so uh, uh, what you what you might say is, well, yes, I understand Cecil Rhodes and, and the manipulation that uh, Big Neff Brzezinski talked about and, and so forth and so on, but if you, and, that, and that's what I try to do in my book. It's, it's like this, I've been piecing for 40-some 45, whatever years, I can't even keep track. About 45 years, this, this puzzle to, together. And, and that's what it is. If you piece the, the parts of the puzzle, see, what happens is the American public may see, you know, one or two pieces, and in and of themselves, they don't mean anything. They're meaningless. But if you start connecting all the pieces to the puzzle, all of a sudden, this larger picture starts to take shape. You know, that's what a puzzle is, a large uh, picture with all these little pieces that you have to put together. And so oh, what happens is it's, it's not just us, but, uh, but the communists. 
They say, oh, you mean the ruthless, evil communists? Yeah, yeah, uh, the ruthless, evil communists, because they're, you know, they're, they're part of this, this whole scenario. As I mentioned, there's a dialectical process. Marx was created as an antithesis to the American values, American independent republic, constitutional republic, capitalist, free enterprise society. So you get the opposite. You get communism. And the synthesis will be socialism, a world socialist government. But before you have the world socialist government, each nation has to be socialist first. And that's what national socialism means, Nazi. And so they created Hitler. And so that's, you know, looking from above, and looking down at this whole history as this big puzzle sort of unfolding, uh, you can get a pretty accurate uh, picture of what's going on. And so what happens is people look at us and we're freedom and, you know, wonderful and uh, fresh air and we can go to the movie and we're, you know, as opposed to those evil, ruthless, conniving, torturing communists. And, and they are. I mean, they are. I mean, you know, Stalin and Lenin, all these guys, Mao Zedong and so forth. But the, but the, the, the problem is they are also suckers. That's why I say sucker nomics. They're also suckers. Because what happens is, and, and you can see this, it's like we went through two no-win wars. You go through Korea's no-win war, and then we didn't learn anything, right? So we go through another Vietnam no-win war. Well, you would think that the Chinese communists would have learned something by the Soviet experience. See, what the paralyte does is they draw these people in. So they drew the Soviets into this race, this sort of arms race, which caused great economic hardships, and financial collapse, and all this. But it was planned. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, my goodness, we're so surprised. Prize, right? So it's planned. Uh, that's why uh, you had Gorbachev succeed Andropov, and he's, you know, smiling and all this sort of stuff. You say, oh, well, that's just practical reality, being practical. No, no, no. Dmitry Manuelsky, back in 1931, in the common turn, delivers a speech saying in about 50 years or so, that's Gorbachev, Gorbachev, the 80s, in about 50 years or so, we'll have the greatest peace defense that the world has ever known, and the West, being stupid and decadent, will fall for this. Blah, 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 blah. All right, so the, the scenario was set from years and years and years and years ago. All right, so here comes Gorbachev on the stage. You know, like Shakespeare said, we're all, the world's a stage and we're all actors upon the thing. And so what you have is uh, Gorbachev appears, and so you would think that the Chinese would have learned something. But no, 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 see, their ambition, right, their ambition. Not, it's not really. They're, it's planned. I mean, you look at the Chinese on the surface, and they look ruthless, evil, totalitarian, right? But even... They, they are planned. Why do you think at Tiananmen Square? Why do you think at Tiananmen Square they waited three or four days to get pictures of everybody, and they round up lots of people, and they run over, and there's blood all over the place? But for some reason, the leadership, sons and daughters, they didn't get swept up and put in the torture chamber. <laughs> Gee, I wonder if they knew something. And so what you have is a situation where hold they... That thought, hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly Dr. Cuddy is just saying that everything is planned, everything is manipulated, and suddenly we hear about how the terrible Chinese communists are. But of course, uh, then there's so many things that happen in China that we really don't understand. And now, of course, China is the second largest economy in the world. Uh, the living standards have gone up phenomenally over in China. The Chinese people are accumulating gold. Uh, they have a great deal of freedom in China. In fact, the Chinese people now can come over here. In fact, a lot of them are coming over here, bringing their money. They want to get out of China because they know something big is about to happen. That's right. But basically, <laughs> you know, so they, China is an entirely different world than it was even a decade ago, certainly two decades ago. And basically, they've adopted all of these concepts, of capitalist concepts, other than the fact they have a dictatorship in charge. The only trouble is that we have all of these capitalist concepts, and we have a dictatorship in charge, too. It's called the Trilateral Commission. And basically, we elect our representatives, but they do exactly what they're told to do because every voting machine in the United States can be electronically rigged. That's why they had to get, get electronic voting machines to give you the idea we're going to be able to change this thing by the electoral process, by simply voting. And yet, of course, there's not one electronic voting machine you can check on and find out if it's giving you an honest vote. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, and so what they, what it appears on the surface is that the Chinese communists, you know, they're ruthless dictators and they want to build up a big army so they can take over the world and at least the uh, south of the uh, south seas and all of their area and just have uh, hegemony uh, over Japan and all these, you know, and be very powerful and so forth and so on. 
Now, you would think they would have learned from the Soviets' efforts to do the same in Eastern Europe and what happened to them with this great big economic push. So what they do, the power leaders, they dangle this little carrot out there in front of them, right? And so they say the U.S. is going to be nice to China, right? They're going to send all these factories over there and build them up, build them up, build them up, right? And so the Chinese, not learning anything, supposedly, supposedly on the surface, supposedly they make stupid mistakes and build these, you know, high-rise cities and all these buildings and apartments that are unoccupied. They're not going to be occupied because, because you know, something, as Dr. Stan just said, something very big is going to happen relatively soon, not the next month or two, but relatively. You can always see some signs. You already can see some signs. that They're going to have tremendous economic plan, uh, problems. And the reason is because you, you can't have some sort of standout really, really successful nation, let's say a China or a Soviet Union or the U.S., you can't have one, right? Because then it could be a model for the others or help bail the others out. So what you have to do is time. See, timing's critical. You have to bring the Chinese disaster at about the same time as the U.S. disaster, as the Greece's disaster, as Spain's disaster, as Mexico's disaster. <laughs> you have to bring all of these economic disasters right into a confluence, sort of a vortex, you know, that sort of circles and spirally sweeps us all down. And that'll happen not not the next month or two, not the next month, or two, but you're starting to see little bitty signs, you know, the stock market's a little teetering. You have the same problems in place that were in place in 2008, same thing. They haven't fixed it. They haven't fixed it. They haven't fixed it. Same symptoms are there. And so all of these things this time will come together in an even worse form, not immediately. Not immediately. You're, you're starting to see little bitty signs. By the end of the year, there'll be bigger signs. And by, by about the time of the election or right after, just before or after the election, you'll start to see, ooh, here's where teetering. And then it'll have a snowballing effect. See, a snowballing effect. And once the thing starts snowballing downhill, then because we have this wonderful global economy where we're hooked up with everybody else, and so if anybody goes down the tube, we go down with them and vice versa. That's the plan. See, that's the plan, and that's why we'll have to have this world currency by about roughly 2018. Now, you know, they can tweak it a little, maybe 2019, you know, but, but the plan is ongoing. It's in place, and, you know, they you know they know what they're doing, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, they're going to bring a disaster. Okay, so anyway, that's I, I try to make some contemporary comments about what's going on. Now, back to the book. Uh, the latest book is The Power Elite, Their History and Future. And the previous book, uh, both of these are offered by Radio Liberty, The Power Lead and the Secret Nazi Plan, uh, really are a combination. Uh, I would hope that your listeners would get both of them, or at least call up their library and have their library uh, get both of the books so they can read them. I don't, I don't see any reason uh, why uh, your listeners can't do that. And uh, what you would uh, find is that one is part of the other. The Secret Nazi Plan is part of the larger Power Lead Plan, and when we get back to the break, we'll pick up where we left uh, off last time, last time with the psychological conditioning of the American people. And ladies and gentlemen, of course, they have to understand that our minds are molded, our ideas suggest that our thoughts largely formed by people we have never heard of. Those are the words of uh, uh, Sidney of Edward Bernay, who is uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew and the author of a book called Propaganda. And he basically talks there on the opening page about how it, uh, important it is, basically, that we are controlled, that the, the, the elite are able to control the masses so that they'll go along with with a preconceived program, and that's just what's happening today. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Okay, well, uh, the uh, part of my book, uh, The Power Elite, Their History and Future, uh, that we're in right now is the psychological conditioning of Americans. Uh, because, like I said, it, it, it's not enough for them just to control the, the economic uh, situation in the world. Uh, they have, uh, you know, people in that, controlling that and the political situation and trying to establish a one-world religion and condition the people and control the legal system with the positivist judges and so forth and so on. So it's all across the board. I, I've given, and I'm, I'm not going to belabor it in the past, how the Rockefellers are part of this, and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the mid-century challenge to American uh, foreign policy. I think that's what it is. That is it's the title. In 1959, was uh, saying how this new world order. Use that term. 1959, it says this new world order that we're going to have. Uh, the responsibility has been given to us, 
uh, the, this elite uh, to form this. And they mentioned political, economic, social, and spiritual. Spiritual, they use that. And I think, I think they use the word spiritual first in that list. Because uh, changing the values of people is a precondition uh, for getting them to go along with certain things. Uh, so, for example, be- before you can have abortion rights and euthanasia of Terry Chavo and, you know, eugenics and all this sort of stuff accepted and ministers of death, as uh, as uh, Robert Hugh Benson said in his book, Lord of the World, which was published in 1907, looking at the future correctly, correctly decades in advance, uh, because, I mean, he wasn't just you know, having a vision or a dream or something. He had been, you know, privy to it. I, I've been through this in the past. His, his father was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he had married Mary Sidgwick, and her brother Henry Sidgwick had been one of the founders of the Society for Psychical Research, which is, was not just a bunch of wackos that include uh, Arthur Balfour, William Gladstone, and British prime ministers. Uh, so, you know, I mean, you know, in this country, John Dewey, Clarence Darrow, uh, Margaret uh, Mead, uh, Jean Houston, and so well. Let me clarify. I guess there are some wacko wackos in, in there. If you include Jean, uh, yeah, just just kidding, Jean. Just kidding. <laughs> not, not really. Whatever. I'm, I'm not going to get that. Okay. So anyway, uh, they have to control the thinking, the thinking processes of the American people. And so that's hold that thought. Hold that thought. We'll be back here in just a moment. <laughs> Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly Dr. Cuddy is talking about how some of these groups of people are organized to control the thought process of the American people. And basically, there are organizations, and what they do is they mold our minds, they mold our thoughts, they create our ideas, and we think the way that they want us to think. You've got to learn to be able to think independently and to understand that the media is controlled, and they're shaping your ideas through the newspapers and the magazines, through the books, uh, certainly through the radio and through television, and all of these are aimed at creating your reality. But you pick up the idea. Dr. Cuddy was talking about this organization around some years ago, and it was made up of many of these ideas, many of these names from the past. This small group of people who are laying the foundation for the control over the mind of the American people that exists today. Dr. Cuddy, just go ahead and repeat a few of those people, the organization and how it was formed to influence what's taking place at the present time. Uh, well, the, the, as usual, there's like a group. Uh, it's just like Cecil Rhodes joined with the, his people, with the Fabian Socialists, with the Skull and Bones people, and so on and so on. Uh, similarly, you would have the Society for Psychical Research formed in the uh, 1880s, just like uh, the Fabian Socialist Society was formed then. And they would link up, and especially in Britain, where you have John Rawlings Reese with Tavistock. Tavistock was formed, the original Tavistock, around 1920. And they would come out of the First World War, uh, which is what Edward Bernays did. Edward Bernays, before he uh, became known as the father of public opinion and wrote the book Propaganda in 1928, he and his wife were uh, involved in World War One, World War One, and those efforts. And of course, you know, Tavistock was just beginning thereafter. Uh, also, the, in this country, the Psychological Corporation began around 1921, and that's why I've mentioned... In the past, when I was a member of the first governor's school in the nation, uh, funded, it was funded by Carnegie. It was in the state that I'm in now, all 50 states have it. I, I thought something fishy was going on. They, it wasn't just that we had a major. You know, you had your major in the morning, whether it was math or science or music or whatever it was. But in the afternoons, you had a minor. That could be dance or, you know, whatever. And, but uh, alternate days, I believe it was uh, the alternate days were either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, you would have what were called the great issues, you know, the great books that have them. And basically, what it was was a sort of a psychological discussion about major issues. You know, let's look at what St. Augustine said. You know, what did Thomas Aquinas say? You know, what did Sigmund Freud say? You know, all, all that sort of stuff. You would discuss these deep issues. And they give us a whole battery of these tests, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory of 771 questions, some of which were sort of normal, but then they, they filtered in there, you know, do you believe in God? You know, questions you're supposed to answer. And so I remember sitting there in the room uh, taking one of these tests, and I think I wrote down by one of the questions, I was like 16 or 17, I think I wrote down on one of none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they didn't like, like that. But anyway, that most of the students just did it. You know, okay, you got a test, I'll answer the question, big deal. But anyway, so I thought something rather sneaky was going on. So years later, I uh, was an, uh, an intern with the Institute of Government here to be a government intern. And I, I wrote, I actually compiled the first 
uh, book on all the functions and services of the State Department of uh, Public Instruction, State Department of Education. So anyway, I had a chance to go to the tester who had been there when I was 16 years old at this governor's school. I said, hey, hey, I want to ask you something. <laughs> and so I went through I went through some of these uh, these things with him. And he, he, had, he had this little sly look on his face. So anyway, a few years later, I said, I wonder what they were really up to. And so I sort of just casually went by the office. He had left by this time. I went by the office, and fortunately for me, they were in transition, moving from the old building to the new building. They had the stuff in a bunch of boxes. I said, hey, you got any stuff on the government school? He said, oh, well, um, yeah, it's in that box over there. You know, just look through it. Anything you want, make a copy. We're okay. We're moving anyway. <laughs> so when I got in there, I found the correspondence between the tester and the psychological corp. I said, the psychological corp? And I said, yep, yep. There it was. So in there, uh, one of the letters that I found was they were writing back and forth. The Psychological Corporation, remember, this is founded in 1920, right at the same time Tavistock was founded over in England. It's, and they said their purpose, 1920, was to get key people in key positions. Get it? Like Cecil Rose? Key people in key positions so they may be useful to the future of the world or something like that. And so uh, what happened was I looked at the letter. It said, we want to keep files on these kids. You know, keep some files. Keep us abreast of these kids, you know, where they're going, what they're doing, and so forth and so on. And so I said, aha, that's what they're up to. And so this was back in the 1960s, and that was uh, right after, when I got back, when I got back from that session, it was the summer between uh, junior and senior year. And, uh, again, I won't belabor it, but my senior year, I thought it was curious, again, one of my assignments was to become Arnold Toynbee. Now, this was an English assignment, senior English. I said, English? He's a historian. What am I doing this for? They said, just do it. <laughs> Okay, so I had to learn all about him, and I get on the stage and give a big old presentation. And I, you know, I'm a naive kid, right? So I sent it over to him at Chatham House in England. It's why me. He writes this nice letter. Hey, great job, kid. You know, couldn't have done better myself. All this stuff. And only later, when Doctor Stan uh, showed me that list of Cecil Rhodes's uh, secret society membership, I said, "Uh oh, look who's there!" <laughs> Arnold, Arnold was there. And so that's when I started looking back. And I said, well, let's see what old Arnold's been up to. And then I found that 1931 speech that he made over in Copenhagen where he said, look, this is what we're about. Now, remember, this is 40 years, 40 years after Cecil Rhodes has founded his society. Now, the reason I'm making a big deal of that is you get a lot of Rhodes scholars. You, you approach a Rhodes scholar and they say, do you know about Cecil Rhodes, the secret society to take over the world? They sort of, you know, chuckle to themselves chortle and oh yeah yeah i heard that stuff but hey hey you know what happened they might have talked about it but then he decided to form the road scholars and that was the end of this conspiracy nonsense ha 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 right and so that's why i like to point out toynbee because toynbee is 40 years after this so if cecil rose is supposed to have dropped the idea you know before his death in the early 1900s what's toynbee talking about 1931 40 years after it about okay guys here's what we we are up to. And he says what we're up to is undermining national sovereignty all over the world. But if they find out about it, he says we will lie with our lips about that, which we are trying to accomplish with all our might with our hands. In other words, yeah, we're doing it, but we're going to lie about it if they catch on to it. And that's exactly what's going on today, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, certainly Barack Obama is not going to tell you, I want a world government. I want to destroy the sovereignty of the United States. He will say, well, I'm a world citizen, but you must understand that he and the people who control Control them have no loyalty to the United States. They are using the financial and military power of the United States to bring about a world government, which is why we spend 40% of all the money spent in the world on the military. We spend 40% of all the money in the world and on the military. And uh, so the, we have our troops in 130 nations. We have 45,000 troops permanently stationed in Germany and 35,000 troops permanently stationed in Japan and 25,000 thousand troops permanently stationed in, in South Korea and 11,000 troops permanently stationed in England and a similar number in Italy and, and many other countries throughout the world. What do you think they're doing there? It's all part of this effort to destroy the sovereignty of our nation and bring about a one world dictatorship under a ruling elite. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, and not only are the troops over there, so are there, you know, $600 toilet seats in the Pentagon. You know, those toilet seats and those hammers get real expensive when they go through the, uh, the defense uh, contractors. And, so like, uh, and also, uh, to show how the, these things are planned way in advance, 
in, in my book, uh, The Globalist. Uh, I may have put it also in Secret Records Reveal, but certainly in The Globalist. Now, I put now in uh, the World Association of Parliamentarians for World Government, which was founded in 1952, uh, you actually see a map of the, the, the planned future of the world when the world government takes place and what nations are policing what other nations. And you would think, oh, yeah, the U.S., it'll be policing Moscow or the Soviets will be policing New York or something. And so when you look at that thing, you see American troops will be in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, not Moscow, not Leningrad, not Petersburg, you know, Kiev, no, Kazakhstan. Well, only later, only 40 years later in the 1990s, when you see that American troops are in Kazakhstan, you understand what it's all about. In the mid-90s, they're in Kazakhstan on maneuvers. Well, what happened at that time? Remember? Big Dan Brzezinski, same time, 1995, says we're going to get through a world government, not through one quickly, but by linking up regional economic arrangements. And then two years later, he authors his book, The Grand Chessboard, where he talks about Caspian oil and how we will manipulate things. And what is he talking about? He's talking about Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and all of those places. But see, way in advance, way in advance, we have these American troops going to be planned for there, for there. And so you can you see the whole world sort of mapped out as to who's going to be, you know, monitoring. And the Soviets would be, say, from about Fort Hood down to Fort Riley, I mean, up to Fort Riley, not Fort Hood, Fort Riley and whatever. As, and when Oklahoma down to New Orleans and then uh, eastward. And sure enough, you know, I, I think I've told you in the past how there was a Soviet uh, policeman out in the western part of my state, which is on the east coast, helping to arrest somebody. And then I got the pictures of these uh, Chinese communist police with our state patrol uniforms on. You know, they're putting on their goggles and all that. They're going to get in their cars and motorcycles and zip around our highways here in my state. In my state, you know, Chinese communists zipping around here. Now, supposedly it was just, you know, a little, you know, exercise. But, you know, why? <laughs> what, what do you want to exercise here for? And why is there a permanent, permanent German military base in the New Mexico? I mean, why? <laughs> why do they need, why do the Germans need a permanent military base in New Mexico? Well, I think the weather is better there for <laughs> flying. That's the yeah. excuse that they use for it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all, it's all phony. The last thing they, they want is for the American people to understand that the people who control our country are subversive. They're, they are, they said they, they've sworn an oath to uphold our Constitution. They hate our Constitution because it limits their power. And what we're doing is moving towards a one world dictatorship with all power in Washington, D.C., and that's why they created this phony war on terrorism. And out of that, now we can justify listening to every telephone conversation, reading every email, reading every fax, recording every radio program, and I can be sure to assure you they record all of my radio programs. They want to know exactly what's going on, and they want to know who's listening, and they want to know who are the potential subversives. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, if we don't take this country back, why we're going to lose it, and we deserve to, but at least we can still communicate. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Yeah, did that FBI agent uh, right after the Murrah building had blown up uh, make a telephone call to you? From Oklahoma. Oh yeah, so he actually, uh, they were. It let me. He let me know they were listening on a regular basis. That yeah, that was that was a long time ago. That was 1995. Go hey, why don't, uh, why don't they buy some of our books? <laughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure that they do, and I'm sure that there are people in government, uh, basically, who love America, but they don't dare come forward. And they know that if they did, they'd lose their job, and maybe they'd lose their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't believe they kill people, you need to get our force. CD set on deadly assassins were actually interview two men trained to kill by our government. They were trained to kill American people. In fact, then the uh, one of the interviews is with a man who tracked down the man who was paid to kill General George Patton. Yes, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, they killed General George Patton because he was going to come home after the Second World War and tell the American people the truth about how we intentionally prolonged that war and we didn't try to win it until for a long, long time. He could have won it six months earlier. They wouldn't let him. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, my dad, who I put some pictures of him at the beginning of my secret Nazi plan book for World War II, when, he, when I was a little fella and, uh, in the 50s and late 40s, uh, way before anybody was, you know, uh, knew about this or thought about it, uh, my, one of the things my dad told me was that Patton did, did not just die by accident. He, 
dead to either do something or heard something or saw something. So and he was he was a very quiet man, but he, he read all the time. He's very very bright, and he he do things. He you know he he had well I've, I've been through that in the past, so we won't do that. All right, uh, all right. So uh, we only got about five minutes. Left. So uh, let me at least touch on the psychological conditioning of Americans, which is in the uh, current book, The Parallel: Their History and Future. And I just talked last week about the subliminal uh, advertisements. And people say, oh, yes, subliminal. But I give specific examples from respected journals as to how they had a test of flashing uh, to a, a, a random audience the word happy, 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 and then asked the viewers what did the man look like, and 80% or so said he's happy, and then they just switched the word to angry, and 80% thought he was angry. Same man. Same man's you know, face flashed on the screen, and it was the subliminal effect of it. Well, uh, two years before the article that I had uh, quoted uh, from at that time, uh, you had... Uh, a publication called uh, Battle for the Mind, subtitled The Mechanics of Indoctrination, Brainwashing, and Thought Control. And it's by a, a psychiatrist named William Sargent. And in, in that, he indicated that if certain, quote, underlying psychological principles are once understood, it should be possible to get a person converting and maintaining him in his new belief by a whole variety of imposed stresses that end by altering his brain function, in quote. And then Sargent went on to explain that the, the human brain, quote, is particularly sensitive to rhythmic stimulation by percussion and bright light. Belief, belief, can be implanted in people after brain function has been sufficiently disturbed by induced fear, anger, or excitement. Of the results caused by such disturbances, the most common one is temporarily impaired judgment and heightened suggestibility, in quote. Now, that, 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 that passage there is full, full of really important things. First of all, stress. You know how stressful society has become over the last 40 or 50 years? It used to be sort of slow and easy going. Now there's a lot of stress, a lot of percussion, right? Rock bands, percussion, bright lights, right? Strobe lights, flash, flash, flash. They alter brain function. And it's not just excitement. You can do it through induced. Remember, induced, not just regular fear, induced fear, induced anger. And what happens when you do all that? Your judgment becomes impaired, and you're open to suggestibility. The suggestibility. So that, this is how they control people. This is what Bernays meant, 1928. He says, we're an invisible government. We are. We know how to manipulate you. You know, we, we are the true, the quote, by the true ruling power of the country. And he was right. He's exactly right. Now, over 20 years ago, <clears throat> I had an article called uh, Beware Subliminal Messages in the Media. And that particular one I wrote uh, was in 1990. It was published in the Orlando Sentinel. I've had hundreds and hundreds, maybe a 1,000 articles in, in regular print, then 200 plus, 260 or so in, uh, on the Internet. And so what, uh, what I did was I reproduced most of that article in one of my News with Views columns. And in part, uh, that article uh, went uh, went uh, like like this. I said that change is becoming an increasing part of American society. Business promotes changing styles to sell products. Social engineers are trying to change our values. There actually seems to be a cult of change today, as many individuals are always seeking something new and different. Remember, I wrote this 20 years ago. And I hear the music, so we'll pick up after the break. Oh, you go right ahead. Okay, well, uh, I set the, the foundation, and then I said much of the stimuli for change has come through television. And there's already some research evidence that a number of people have engaged in violent behavior based upon the violence they see on television. Remember that's induced anger? Remember what Sergeant said, induced anger? One wonders, I say, also how many might have been affected by messages such as Read us any rule, we'll break it. Remember that? That's the theme from the Laverne and Shirley show. Read us any rule, we'll break it. And then I say, how many saw one of the first episodes of Hardball, as a TV show, where the two police heroes toss rocks at the streetlights and hold that thought, ride hold, the bike? Hold the thought. Well, Dr. Kelly, you go right ahead. We've got three minutes to wrap up the program. Go right ahead. Okay, well, I was giving specific examples of how the media is inducing us to do certain things, like Laverne and Shirley. Part of their theme is read us any rule, we'll break it. And then you have the show Hardball from 20 or so years ago. Now, their two police heroes are tossing rocks at a streetlight just to see who would ride a bike. 
See? Lawbreaker. Destroy a streetlight. Government property. Taxpayer. Let's destroy it. The police. And then they say, quote, now we're lawbreakers. So they admit it. Currently, uh, I said, now this is from the 1990s, there is an ad showing a child rigging a contraption to swipe his father's ego waffle, which certainly doesn't reinforce the biblical admonition, thou shalt not steal. See, it's very subtle. It's not like the uh, the James Bond movies, you know, you're, in, you're drawn into it. You're, you know, a hero fighting the evil communists. And then, incidentally, they just sort of slip in him, you know, jumping the bed with all these, these foreign spies and fornication and so forth. And, and you, as a Christian, you're supposed to overlook that because you've been induced to think, you know, your impaired judgment, you've been induced to think uh, that, well, you know, he's, he's, you know, we have to overlook that because he's doing so much good fighting the evil communists. Well, then what happens? You have heightened suggestibility, right? Like Sergeant said, hey, here's a hero, right? Macho guy, famous, uh, going out with all these women, doing all this stuff. There's a suggestibility, right? Remember, they change from the cognitive to the affective domain. So if you want to be a macho kind of superhero, you too should fool around with women and so forth. They don't, they don't say it on TV. There's nobody, man, comes on and says, hi, fool around with women. They don't say that. But what they do is have an associative, an association with a, a heroic image doing that. And the same thing with uh, Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood, you know, much admired, right? Well, in one of his movies, this woman is, you know, bad-mouthing him. He basically grabs her, takes her into a barn, and has his way with her. But you're supposed to overlook that, right? Because all these evil bad guys are doing bad things, and he's beating them up. So you overlook him basically raping this woman. At least that's the implication. And so, you know, here's Clint Eastwood. Oh, yeah, great guy, big hero. Same thing with educators. John Dewey, oh, wonderful guy, progressive educator. You know, overlooked the, the fact that he was over in the Soviet Union and said Bolshevism is wonderful, they're undermining the church and the family. You know, forget about that. And so this is how they do it. And uh, I guess we'll pick up next time. I think the two minutes are up. We're just about out of time. Well, I want to thank you very much. Our guest has been Dr. Dennis Cuddy. We've been talking about what's going on in his book, of course, uh, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan, The Power Elite, uh, their history and their future. God bless you, Dennis. We'll look forward to talking to you next week at the same time. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. This is Dr. Stan, and we do hope you enjoy our weekly conversation with Dr. Cuddy, certainly one of the most astute and uh, people that we have in the conservative movement, a wonderful source of information, and we carry his books, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan, The Power Elite and certainly the, their history and their future. So there's two separate books. We have his book on uh, Sydney on the Secret Records Revealed. We have his book on quotable quotes. We have a number of books. You can get them by calling 1-800-544-8927. We have all of his books that are in print. And you need to get them. You need to read them. And you are privileged to hear Dr. Cuddy every week. Certainly one of the leaders uh, of what's going on. You can get his, certainly his articles off the Internet. And certainly with, at New News with Views. That's News with Views. We recommend his material. Uh, Dr. Cuddy is a personal friend. And then, of course, we do hope you'll want to get my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, because it will take you into the uh, into the uh, secret societies that exist. Not just one. There are a multitude of them. But they all have a common goal, and that is a one-world government. They want a one-world government, a one-world financial system, and they want to destroy Christianity, which is why uh, the, the Masons, who controlled the United States Supreme Court in 1962, uh, took God and prayer out of our schools. And the fact that nobody will tell you that, your minister is not going to tell you that, I said the, uh, the media is not going to tell you that, shows you how far the, this control is into every aspect of our society. The Masons controlled the Supreme Court from 1941 to 1971 in majorities of five to 63 to 5 to 4. And during that time, they set out to transform America. And basically, of course, now, of course, we have other people in this 
Supreme Court. And many of them, of course, have been compromised. In fact, we're doing an interview this evening with a gentleman who worked for our government. He was a homosexual. His job was to seduce congressmen and senators and other government officials so they would have something on them so that those people would be subject to doing exactly what they were told. His man is Robert Merritt. You can hear our program this evening. This is the way the world really works. But you're not going to get this through regular channels because the media is rigidly controlled. And if you don't believe that, you need to get the book we carry called The New Media Monopoly. That's The New Media Monopoly. And it simply points out that well over 90% of the major corporations, media corporations, are controlled by six uh, corporations because that was in 2004. It's probably about eight today. But our telephone number is one 800 Five four four eight nine two seven. One eight hundred five four four eight nine two seven. You need to get this information. You need to read it. You need to study it. You need to tell others. You need to be involved because, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving into an economic contraction, which is a prelude to another major economic catastrophe, which is a prelude to war. And I fear in this next war, millions are going to die, and these are going to be millions of Americans. Remember, we killed a million South Vietnamese and two million North Vietnamese during the Vietnam War. Why don't we ever talk about that? We killed a million North Koreans during the Korean War. Why don't we ever talk about that? As the forces were just name, hired to go over into Syria, are responsible for the deaths of probably 120 to 130,000 innocent civilians. They would be alive if we had not hired suddenly these uh, terrorists to go over there to Syria to overthrow the existing government. Uh, and basically, it is our tax money, American tax dollars, that work. And so we were behind the revolution that took care of place in Libya and probably killed between 50 and 100,000 people there. And their blood is on your hands, ladies and gentlemen, if you're not involved. If you are, then, of course, you're doing everything you can. But you have a responsibility, and men and women become accomplices to the evils they feel to, fail to oppose. Are you an accomplice? Please pray for America. Pray for revival. Join us in this epic struggle. But then we ask you, of course, to pray for my ministry, Radio Liberty, for our provision and protection, and so until Monday, may the Lord be with you.